Network. All right, so this panel that we're going to do first for you, uh, we just labeled it newbies. And you know what? These guys are actually pretty experienced in the industry, uh, but they are younger breweries, and they're, it's their first time at the Firestone Walker Invitational. So I think that's worthy of a, applause. Yeah. Because not everybody gets invited. And uh, I know the brewmaster at Firestone, his name's Matt Brennelson. He'll be up here for our second panel. And he's told me stories before where his friends in the beer industry call him and they go, hey, like, you know, why did, how, come I, how come I didn't get my invite to the, the Firestone Invitational? And he's like, you know, it's an invitational, right? Like, if I don't invite you, you don't get to go. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about that, like, you know, what it's like to be a brewer here and... Uh, I think my first question, let me introduce the guys here and then we're going to get right into like how you get invited. Directly to my left, we have Doug Constantiner from Society Brewing Company. Hello. Out of San Diego. Uh, they make great beer. If you haven't been to their tent, uh, you should do that. But that's the first beer we're going to pour in your glass today. So as soon as those pitchers are going around, which I, I think I see one of them over there, uh, that's Doug's beer. I think it's Coachman. It's the Coachman, yeah. 4.7%. Uh, we call it a really small IPA which basically most people say it's a session IPA, but uh, we can get into that another day, what session is. Okay. But uh, you know, we have uh, on the same side, uh, instead of calling it a double IPA, we have big IPA and really big IPA. So this is our really small IPA. Uh, it won gold at the Great American Beer Festival, so we're really proud to pour it and make sure people know that uh, there is more out there than high alcohol beer. Love it. And one of the requirements for the festival is that brewers bring a session beer, right? A lower That's alcohol right, beer. Yeah. Below 6%. So Below 6 We probably would have brought it anyway. But Is there another requirement? What, do you uh, have to bring think, a big uh, beer? or uh, rare or a unique. Okay. So we brought a first ever released sour beer, long awaited. And uh, so we're pouring that too. It's called a Swindler 6.4% uh, blonde sour. Nice. Yeah, I've seen your barrel room like for the last maybe three years or something. Right. I keep, every time I go there, I ask it, hey, you know, when do I get a beer out of the barrel room? And you've never really answered that question. You just keep looking at me <laughs> like that. Now, now's the day. Now's the day. Right. <laughs> so uh, we're hoping to actually sell bottles of them next weekend. Oh, cool. For our anniversary. And okay. uh, hoping, got to make sure the labels come in and everything like that. But uh, we're, we're ready and we're gearing up for it. And All right. We're happy it's finally come. Beautiful. All right. We'll talk more about that beer. And then to Doug's left, we have Matt Gallagher from Half Acre Brewing Company out of Chicago. Yeah. Welcome, Matt. And uh, also your first year here at the festival, right? Uh, yeah, it is. It is our first first time out here. Okay. And we're going to pour Matt's beer second. Do you know what you brought us here? Uh, it should be our, our pale ale, which is uh, Daisy Cutter. Okay. Uh, so nice, easy drinking pale ale. Beautiful. I love a good pale ale. And then to the left of Matt, we have Adam. Oh, man, you told me how to... It's Beecham. See, but it's spelt like Beauchamp. Yeah, it sucks. It's, it's French and it's English, and every time... You know. It's the simple <laughs> ones that fuck me up, though. So it's just yeah. Beecham. Yes, Beecham. All right, good. <laughs> so it's Adam. He's from Creature Comforts out of Athens, Georgia. And that's a great, yeah, if you haven't been to that booth, make sure you do that, too. We'll be pouring his beer right here at the stage also. All right, so the first thing, let me just ask, like, how do you get invited to the Firestone Invitational? Do you, do you even know? Is there a criteria? Do you submit? Yeah, I mean, for us, um, we had a guy, a local guy uh, that was a fan of our brewery, lived around Athens. Uh, ended up getting a job in the cellar at Firestone, and he uh, sent me an email one day, looped me in with Matt, and he was really pushing for us to be invited. And uh, I mean, one of the key things that we really focus on is trying to attend the really premier events as much as possible. It's just incredible connections, it's camaraderie, it's a lot of fun, but you just uh, you get to meet these people that are really transforming the beer landscape, and there's a lot of information sharing and stuff. So for us. It's just such an honor and just such a special time. Firestone's obviously doing an amazing job with it. But yeah, Evan kind of looped us in with Matt and uh, started talking, and it just kind of went from there, and we got the invite. So it's pretty simple. You don't question it when you get the invite, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. Just, right. We'll be there, yes. You just say yes. Yeah. <laughs> so like 10 or 15 years ago, 
Brewers just said yes to every festival invite they got. It was a marketing tool, and you, you gave free beer to every festival in the world. And I run a festival, too, and I feel like that's changed now because there's a billion festivals every summer. So how do you guys deal with that now? Do you still keep saying yes? We won't. Uh, I don't believe, and this is not my, my area, but I don't believe that we send beer to festivals that don't buy the beer anymore. Okay. Um, and, uh, it you know, it has to be sort of a focus on the quality and not these like marketing driven or like distributor driven things where they bring their whole portfolio and none of the brewers are there pouring beer. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty easy to kind of differentiate, I think. And there, there are these festivals that are just meant to be like money makers for people. And, um, we're able to kind of see through that and it doesn't represent our brand. So it's not something that we're trying to be a part of. So, yeah. I've wondered about it because as consumers, so ticket prices keep going up for these festivals, right? Like Firestone's about the best value because you get so much out of it. You, no one's ever going to balk at that price. But as festivals start only you know, having to purchase beer, the model is changing. Yep. Ticket prices go up. We still want to go taste all that good beer, yep. uh, but it gets tricky. Absolutely. Um, you know, I've never never been on that side of it, but I, I, I think they generally make money. So, you know, it's, it's no other model that people don't buy your beer. And honestly, like, we're just limited on supply. So um, if we're giving away beer to somebody, then we have 100 retailers that are kind of like, what the fuck, you know? Yeah. Like, <laughs> So we just, we can't do that. No, it's a good point. Yeah. All right, let's go back to Doug real quick so you can tell us more about the beer that's in our glass. You know, about the hops and give us the whole deal. All right, so uh, this was spurred off a kind of a continuum where we started making lower alcohol hoppy beers, something that we didn't really think could be done. Kept giving it a shot and uh, finally came down to the coachman. It's uh, Mosaic and Simcoe all through it, about 40% wheat malt. And that's how we were able to kind of beef up the body and really hop it. And all of our beers, if you guys can taste through them, not that we have everything here, but uh, it's a lot, a lot uh, late hop additions. So that way we can get as much flavor and aroma in there as possible without the bitterness. Okay. And what I've talked to you be about before is that uh, we're not about, you know, just because you have 60 IBUs doesn't mean the beer has to be 1060 in original gravity. Uh, to us, what really matters is the finishing gravity and how the final beer is, and then we judge the hops. And so we like to have a super hoppy beer that's not offensive, that's not too bitter, um, but we also can do a bitter beer, which we have. But um, that's, it's supposed to be a very flavorful, piney, citrusy, grapefruit, everything you want out of an IPA in a low alcohol format. And it's something that, I, you know, you look at the alcohol percentage, I could have three of these versus, you know, two of uh, 7% or 8% IPA. More the merrier in my belly. Absolutely. So then, so it used to be that we would look at a menu and we'd see the IBUs and we could kind of select our, our favorite beer based on that if we were hop heads. But now it sounds like the IBUs mean a little less, especially with this late hop additions you're talking about. Right. So IBUs are a uh, calculated, measured number. Right? International bittering units. I, we're all beer geeks here, but sometimes I just try right. to dumb it down. Anyway. Exactly. So uh, that's way different from perceived bitterness. Okay. So uh, good examples I use is a, a wit beer or something like that, where you put in orange peel, which is going to add bitterness oh. that's not going to come up on BUs. Right. So we try and think about things like that, that uh, we're adding a lot of dry hops to everything. You're picking up BUs in there that are perceived bitterness that people aren't going to know as BUs. So I wonder if we're eventually going to have another number that we could look at as consumers to know, you know, what, what kind of hoppy, because now, because that's bitterness, right? But then there's, like you're talking about, perceived, there's flavor, perceived, perceived bitterness, bitterness. bitterness, but then there's the flavor of the hops and, and how much that's going to be in there. So I feel like we need a new descriptor. I think uh, there doesn't need to be a descriptor. Do you like the beer? How does it taste? That's a good descriptor. Yeah. Uh, I do like the beer. I don't, I don't. I don't want people to uh, order our beer based off a number and say, "Oh, I'm looking for something. I, I want a hop fix, or I want uh, something that's malty," because you can have super malty beers that are bitter, like a Russian Imperial Stout. Yeah. Right. So, that's true. Or yeah. you can have something that's super malty, like a 3.8 percent mild, 3.2 percent mild, yeah. which is an English beer, uh, small beer, and it's. Uh, so uh, it's all relative, and I don't think 
anybody should be ordering beers based off of stats. Well, Same you thing. clearly haven't been talking to enough beer geeks because <laughs> we love but stats. Would you ever, uh, or maybe some people here, but uh, I would never drink based on alcohol percentage, yeah. right? I think that's probably the most important metric and uh, contributes a lot of flavor on both ends, but uh, you don't drink to get drunk. Why would you drink for IBUs? Sure. That makes sense. All right. You saying that, it just brought this up in my mind. We're going to do a little test here of the audience. We're going to see the quality of beer drinkers that we have here at the Firestone Walker Invitational. Raise your hand and be honest. It's okay. I won't berate you for too long. Uh, raise your hand if you've ever walked up to a booth at a festival and said, give me your highest alcohol beer. All right, there we go. We got some honest people here. Okay, that's right. Be honest. There's a few of you. Now, that's a really low number, meaning the Firestone Fest is a good festival for people to come to. Right? Like, that used to be the thing, right? People will come up. Some of these festivals that you were talking about, Adam, where people come up, uh, maybe it's not about the quality of the beer. They just want their $50 yeah. worth of unlimited pours. It's like a $40 all-you-can-drink kind of thing, like yeah. drink to you, drop. You know, that's sometimes you sometimes you get drunk. But, uh, you know, hopefully these things are a little bit more about the flavor and the quality and the experience. So, yeah. All right. I got another question for you. Uh, we'll start with Matt here in the middle. Um, what got you into craft beer and brewing? It seems like everybody had a life before craft beer, some other job. What did you do before craft beer, Matt? Um, yeah, I was a metal. Hold that close to your mouth for oh, me. Sorry. I was a metallurgical engineer. Okay. So. All right. So that's perfect for, for getting into brewing. Yeah. You find metallurgical engineers hot? Is that what just happened? There we go. All right. She yeah. has a calendar of metallurgical engineers yeah. on her fridge. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so what got you into beer then? Uh, well, I, 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 I went out to grad school to, uh, to Golden, Colorado. So I, I grew up in New Jersey. Um, you know, not a lot of not a lot of uh, adventurous beer being being consumed by myself out out in New Jersey, and then uh, moving out to Colorado is just like a huge cultural change, and being introduced to uh, all the breweries out there that are that were in Colorado at the time, and um, got into it out there, and then I moved to Chicago to take a job working at one of the steel mills, and uh, I was kind of like, man, there's you know there's only like a small handful of breweries out here, like how come there aren't more breweries in this gigantic city? Uh, so then about six, seven years later, uh, joined, uh, got Half Acre going. Okay. Yeah. So did some research to try to figure out why there weren't more breweries there. <laughs> what was the reason? Well, uh, it, it's just such a pain, and it's a, it's a pain in the ass in, in the city of Chicago. Like to do business in general, probably. Yeah, to, in general, brewing. You know, irregardless of what you're doing, just doing anything there is is a challenge. Uh, but uh, but you look at it now. There's there's like over 100 breweries in the state of Illinois now. Uh, so all those barriers have now been removed, and it's. Um, yeah, it's awesome. Let's pour Matt's beer, too, if we have that ready, the half-acre beer. Is that what's going out right now? Beautiful. All right, that'll be uh, what's in your glass. Uh, what are we pouring? So this should be uh, this should be Daisy Cutter, which is our, our pale ale. Um, basically, everything Doug said uh, relates to Daisy Cutter as well in terms of, you know, trying to get a lot of hop flavor and aroma into the beer, uh, but keeping it low alcohol, keeping it easy to drink. Um, you know, we like, we like drinking beer, um, and we like drinking pints of beer so it's nice to have a pint of beer that's nice and hoppy uh, but it's not you know nothing crazy you can have a couple of them um, we'll get back into the session discussion <laughs> I'm just kidding <laughs> we can come back to that um, don't forget us up here on stage too we we need some beer that's true yeah we need some beer <laughs> we want to try the pale ale <laughs> <laughs> so if any of you volunteers have a little extra we would love some uh, thank but you yeah, you're uh, lovely uh, Daisy Cutter for us is it's uh, it's it's definitely the biggest the biggest part of our brewery is this beer. Uh, it's and the most popular. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's our most popular beer. Um, Pale Ale's my favorite yeah. style after all these years. Being a beer geek, I started this Thanks. company, the Brewing Network, like 11 years ago, drinking Pale Ale's. And everybody else evolves. I'm such a creature habit. Pale Ale is still my favorite style on earth. Just a good, clean, and, and a West Coast Pale Ale, American Pale Ale, they just keep getting better. Let's see how you did here, Matt. I'm going to judge you right now. <laughs> All right. Let's, let's let it out. Oh, yeah, you pass. 
Yeah, nice. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a good <laughs> beer. One of my favorites for a while. Tell us about it. The hops inside and um... yeah, it's um, it's a lot of Amarillo, Simcoe, and then uh, Columbus and Centennial. Um, but you know, for, you know, as as we've been, you know, learning learning our craft and a lot. The the biggest part for me now in terms of coming up with a hoppy beer, it all it all starts with the malt. Uh, you know, the hops are the hops are obviously the biggest part of it, but to let those hops shine correctly is, um, you know, it's key to, key to work on the malt flavors to, to find that balance that, you know, we, we're all always trying to achieve that, you know, perfectly balanced beer. So what did you do here for the malt? Uh, so this has some, you know, it has more specialty malts than, uh, than probably pale ales being brewed um, now by newer brewers have, but uh, it's got a lot of victory malt in it, which is uh, kind of like a biscuity, kind of a toasty biscuity malt. And then it's also got a malt called uh, Special Roast, which is, uh, I think now, like if I was coming up with a pale ale now, I would never put Special Roast in it, but uh, it's in there. Because uh, <laughs> uh, sometimes it, you know, it's it's roasty. It's a, it's, it's a slight roasty flavor that, um, you know, it in some ways can can cover up some of those those nice hoppy flavors, um, but it's always been in this beer, and uh, it kind of it kind of gives the beer is while it's it's hoppy, it's not it's still fairly malty for for being a a, a hoppy pale ale and uh, gives it a nice balance I think. I, I I think the American palate has started to lean more toward the drier beers, right? Not quite as sweet, which they could still be malty and dry, right? Yeah, but th- yeah. Have you had to adjust for that or, or make changes? Um, that, well, that's a funny story, too, because, uh, you know, we, we've always focused on making really dry beers, dry hoppy beers. Um, and the, the temperature probe in our mash tun uh, is about five degrees off. <laughs> Did you know that? Uh, well, we now know that. Okay. Uh, but at the time, you know, we're, even at there was times we were trying to make beers to finish high, and we're like, man, our yeast just does not want to finish high. But it was because our, our mesh probe was, was five degrees off. Uh, so that's a big part of our brewery, too, is making dry beers. So uh, funny side note. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to ask this of all of you, but you have the microphone, so we'll start with you. Uh, where did you learn to brew? I mean, you started in metallurgy, but where did you learn to make great beer? Um, yeah, I did, I did some home brewing, but really only about a year of home brewing. So... I really learned on the job. Um, uh, early on at Half Acre, we had some really good brewers as well that I learned from. Uh, Probrewer.com, if anybody ever goes on Pro Brewer, I learned a ton on Pro Brewer. <laughs> uh, just reading through their books. Uh, and the best thing is everyone is so open. Yeah. The industry is so amazing. Uh, and being in Chicago where uh, there's a couple of really good, well-established breweries like you know, Goose Island, Three Floyds, uh, that, that are always open and uh, willing to to share everything that they had, they had learned. So we learned a lot from them. People ask me, and I'm going to have all you guys answer this, but I'm just thinking about it. People ask me all the time why uh, so many crap breweries are opening, why it's so popular, why people do it. And, of course, like the easy answer is that we all love beer, but I think another component of that is it's, it's a DIY career. Like so many brewers start as home brewers, and they learn how to do it, and they love it, and they see a way to start a business and make a living, and there's not a lot of careers that are like that. You know, everything else you, you do have to go to school for. And I think there's something to be said for brewing school, by the way, there's some amazing brewers coming out of brewing school, but the DIY aspect, I think, has helped grow craft beer. How'd you learn to brew? Uh, the Brewing Network. Yes! <laughs> you know that's why I put this question in there. <laughs> uh, no, it was, uh, I learned how to home brew from the Brewing Network. Learned a bunch of brewing, but uh, I was a professional brewer before society, and uh, yeah, you guys actually very much helped me <laughs> You know, take that dive, jump out of the corporate world, and go into professional brewing. But um, you were a, a, like a stockbroker, investment banker. Investment banker yeah. was Dougie. So if you need any advice, no, don't ask. Don't him. come to me. <laughs> but uh, no, it's uh, the DIY is absolutely true, and I relate brewing a lot to cooking. And you say, you know, there's uh, some guy who's worked for Thomas uh, Thomas Keller. That's his name, right? The uh, French Laundry. Yep. Somebody's worked for him that didn't graduate middle school, but he's been with them for 20 years. I'll hire him any day over some guy that went to Harvard and graduated from, you know, some sort of premier cooking school. And there's something to be said about uh, formal education, but it's not everything. I think experience, learning on the job, and I think that's uh, Travis, my business partner, and I uh, learned a lot brewing for other people. Uh, 
what not to do, yeah. what to do, and that helped us kind of save some money when we were, I should say, not lose money building out the brewery. And <laughs> Is that where you're at now? It. You're not losing money? Yeah, we're not losing as much that's as we good. should. That's yeah. good. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the, the, do it, the DIY thing is huge, and that's why we try and encourage anybody who's looking to start a brewery. We say, for one year, go work at a brewery. I don't care if you're washing kegs, work in the tap room, whatever it is. And uh, it, we've had a couple people say, well, I, I can't afford to you know, make minimum wage. I go, well, why are you going to start a brewery then? Because <laughs> that's what you're going to yeah. make. Uh, don't, don't get into it for the money because it's not going to come ever. Yeah. I own a tap house now, and I was trying to figure out what I make right now. It's less than minimum wage. Yeah. When you count the hours, the hours you have to put absolutely. in. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, you lose sleep, and it's uh, it, it has to be something you absolutely love. It has to be something that... It's not that you like doing it and you hate your job, so I'm going to do this. It has to, you have to, if you love the job you're at right now, but you love brewing more, then it's a good fit. Okay. You have to have kind of a uh, no, uh, failure is not an option. This is the only thing you want to do, and that's kind of how it was for, for me and for Travis. And I love it. All right, Adam, what about you? Yeah, um, I uh, was in the life sciences. Um, before getting into brewing, I, I have a degree from UGA in genetics and one in ecology, and I was working on a PhD in genetics and molecular biology, and I was probably hanging out at the local brewery a lot, uh, maybe a little too much, um, and just sort of saw their success. Like, they were these guys that I kind of knew them, and they were, like, they were just growing like crazy. This is a Sweetwater Brewing Company in Atlanta, by the way. Good beer. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So that's where I cut my teeth, basically. Dropped out of grad school. Um, had to tell my parents that I wasn't going to cure cancer or anything like that. I was going to go run a brew house. Um, so Are they still reeling from that? Well, I, now that I own my own business, I think it's a little more of like a proud moment for them. Can but you send beer home? So Yeah, yeah, exactly. They appreciate that. Um, but no, it wasn't an easy conversation for sure when uh, we made the transition but you know uh, at that point I uh, just I actually quit grad school which I was getting a stipend for um, and just volunteered for like two months before they gave me a job interview or anything so that's that's sort of another thing like you're probably gonna go into a little bit of debt um, if you make the transition it's not an easy one it's particularly now to break into the industry um, and then especially opening your own business it's gonna be financially difficult personally unless you just have money um, so uh, you know I worked uh, worked about seven years at Sweetwater um, I really took um, the time there to learn as much as I could about a production environment so I, I spent time in every production department um, and they were really amazing about that actually I was very upfront with the fact that I wanted to run my own business someday and they allowed me to jump around quite a bit I actually worked in the lab for a good while uh, I was a brewer for about four years and then I ended up wanting to go back to the cellar because I think it's the most challenging and sort of difficult job in the brewery um, so I uh, started looking around and uh, looked at a couple different breweries in Georgia. I wanted to stay close to home. I have good family. My wife has a good family that we didn't want to move too far away from. Um, and uh, so Georgia was pretty limited. Like, we have some pretty shitty laws. And uh, so there weren't a lot of things opening up for years. And part of the reason that I stayed on at Sweetwater um, was because there wasn't anywhere else to work in Georgia. Um, but, um, you know, while I was there, I think I got that deep experience, um, which, you know, definitely worked for one year, but, I, you know, seven years is better. You know, like, it's, <laughs> it's, I mean, not to say that, I don't know how many years you worked in a brewery, but um, it's, you run into things that you just, there's a million little things that happen and your ability to troubleshoot and to just effectively come up with solutions and just to be that kind of like solution oriented thinker, uh, it develops over a long period of time. Um, so, I don't know, got the right opportunity and jumped on Creature Comforts, and it's been it's been pretty nice. All right. Are we pouring the Creature Comforts beer yet? We should start that if we have that around. Yeah. You guys already got in your glass? What, I don't know. What's what the we, beer we're having? I, I do not know what we brought. Is anybody? Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> it's beer. Let's shut up and drink it. It looks like it might be Tropicalia by the color. Um, <laughs> is it IPA? Tritonia. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. I want to talk about Are those Tritonia. your friends or are they beer fans who just know your beer? <laughs> I don't know. Hey, guys. <laughs> Tritonia? 
Uh, yeah, so uh, we have a beer called Athena, which is our, our Berliner Weiss, and in some of, so that's our city, uh, Athens, and so uh, we named the beer after our, our place that we have the brewery. Uh, Tritonia, and some of the myths, Athena's father is actually Poseidon, and her name is Tritonia. Um, so it's, it's sort of an alternate version of Athena. Uh, the Poseidon reference, the god of the sea, so this is a Goza. It's the Goza, Goza version, so it's salty. Um, this particular Goza has been flavored with cucumber and lime. Um, so this is a kettle soured uh, Goza, uh, which I'm What not does kettle sour mean? So we actually were able to really precisely control the pH of the beer by uh, doing the first fermentation with lactobacillus inside the brew house. Um, and it's something that, you know, is a, certainly a bit contentious among brewers. Um, we don't pretend that this is a barrel aged mixed fermentation beer that took us a year and a half to make. This beer takes us about 14 days to produce in the brewery. Um, and we price it, you know, along in line with our regular core lineup. So it's $9.99 a six pack. All right. So let me just clarify. So what happens a lot with sour beer is you, you make it in the brew house, then it goes to fermentation, and then it lands in a barrel or something, some other vessel, and over time it sours in that vessel. And it takes a while, and that's why it's expensive and everything else. But a kettle sour means you make it in the brew house, and then it sits in the kettle, and what? Does it cool down in the kettle? No, we, we want to maintain about 110 degrees in the kettle. Uh, lacto, it's just like a yogurt fermentation. It likes warm temperatures. Um, so we use two strains of bacteria. It takes us about seven, eight hours. We drop the pH from 4.8 to about 3.45, and that's money for us. We like it not too sour, not, not too unsour, so that's like right down the middle. Uh, from there, we kill all the lacto. So lacto is doing the souring work. We bring it up to a boil, and then we put it through our regular cellar, just like a normal beer, so we don't have to have special tanks that are just for mixed fermentation. It allows us to really make that a production beer, and that was just a niche that we we saw, like, we all love sour beer and we like to drink light Berliner Weiss or, or Goza, and um, nobody was doing it at a good price point in Georgia where it could be an everyday beer for people, because I, mean, I think, you know, bitter balanced beers are great. I, I couldn't live without hoppy beer, I don't think, but uh, it's also nice to have the option for a good, affordable sour beer. Yeah, I think it's a great way to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, affordable is key. I always tell people, so we all sip sour beer in America, mm -hmm. and we think that we we think that's the way it's supposed to be. The truth is we sip sour beer in America because it's expensive. Mm -hmm. And we get it like four ounces at a time. We have to share it with everybody. The first time I went and had, it was like a goose or something in Belgium. I ordered a goose and I expected to get my little glass of goose. And they brought me a pint, yeah. a pint of Cantillon goose for eight <laughs> euros or something. It's people's beer. It blew my mind. I was like, this is amazing. And I drank eight of them. Uh, sour beer is so dry and refreshing. It's meant to be drank in, in quantity, mm -hmm. but it's so expensive to make that it's kind of a hard thing for us to do here. It also shouldn't be uh, enamel destroying. With all that uh, like acidity? Yeah, it should be a balanced thing, just like bitterness or hoppiness. It should all be a symphony of flavors, and I think uh, sometimes when it is a sipping thing, it, it's it might be too sour, or it might be too for me. And what I want You're with right, everything, yeah. it, it should be something, you know, we got into beer because we like drinking large volumes relatively to other things. And I'm not talking, you know, drinking 100 ounces, but uh, if we wanted to sip on four ounces, we probably all could have gotten into whiskey or wine or something else that would have been great. Yeah. But I got into beer because I like having a lot to drink. Yeah, you know, I agree. Volume-wise, having three pints, you that's a, a good time, and I want to enjoy it. It's a social thing. It should be an afterthought to socialization. It shouldn't be uh, something where you, you uh, think about it too much, especially in situations like this. We're at a festival. It should be enjoyed. Yeah. I agree with you 100%. Yeah, this beer is, I mean, it's super refreshing, so it's its excellent for today. I mean, cucumber, for some reason, I don't know, the flavor is just like, you feel like you're in air conditioning or something automatically. <laughs> but it's a good descriptor. Yeah. That's a flavor descriptor, yeah. right? Exactly. Air, air yeah. conditioning. AC. Yeah. yeah. Um, to, to get the flavor, I, I was going to mention, um, it's a, its actually an ethanol distillate, so we're, we're pretty proud of that, actually. We're not processors of fruit. Like, we you know, we're not good at, like, squeezing cucumbers or anything like that. We're brewers, so... We're able to find this company that makes this beautiful distillate that the only two ingredients are ethanol and cucumbers. 
Um, and like when you put it in a beer, it's just so nice. Like so. How do you put it in? Is is it a lot of it? You, you just dump it right in. Now yeah. for like a sixty barrel tank, uh, it's like two liters. So it's like it's wow. super concentrated aroma and flavor. Um, that we you know they make a whole range of stuff, and some of them are closer than others to the actual flavor that you're getting. But this one, it was just plain delicious, and we like. So we take it definitely like a pragmatic approach, you know, we're like, if it's not whole cucumbers, we're not ashamed of that, you know, we're not these like romantic brewers that we have to like have the most like traditional processes. Like I'm all about like, if the beer is good, drink it, you know, brew it, drink it. So uh, you said you put it in. And right it, tank. Okay. Yeah. Post fermentation, chilled beer. Yeah, exactly. Post filtering. It's an uh, yeah, we have a centrifuge. Uh, it's an aromatic, so we usually add those as late as possible, basically. Got it. Um, yeah. What does it taste like on its own? Is it like, like cucumber vodka? I can't even imagine. Or something? Like, Did you ever take a little it, sip? It might be like cucumber OD. Like literally, like <laughs> this is. <laughs> It'd be bad. <laughs> it's probably dangerous in some way. I don't know. But, yeah. Shots. Yeah. <laughs> All right. If anybody has questions, we've got a microphone right up here by the front table, so you can just come stand up at the microphone, and and we'll take care of if you want to ask these guys any questions. I got another one, and. I almost hate to ask this question, but I think it's a good one because everybody wants to know. It's just hard to answer. But So IPAs, look, they're never going away. And that's good. We all love IPAs. And the new darling is sour beer, like we've been talking about. What's next? Like, where do we go from here? We, we've had barrel-aged beer. We've had sour beer and uh, the hoppiest beer in the world. What do you think we're going to get next? Beer. Just beer? Beer. Like a Pilsner? Or an ale, whatever it is, exactly. it's beer. Just I a think beer. Uh, we all need to come back and realize that the most, the holy grail of beer is not the rarest beer, not the hardest to find, not the most aged. It's just beer. I use uh, Sierra Pale Ale as my example. They have the holy grail. That is a beer you can have every single day, and you love it. It it, it excites you every single day. I mean, every single time you drink it. The next day, it's just as good. The next day, it's just as good, and you're just as impressed. And to me, that's what beer is about. It's not seeking out something else that uh, nobody else can find, and there's only 100 bottles of. Uh, Not that small batch or something that is rare is bad, but rarity should not be seen as a high-quality thing. Uh, They do not go hand in hand. Uh, Everyone asks, you know, what's your Desert Island beer? I think everybody needs to really think about that question because when you drink beer, I mean, what does everybody drink at home? You're not searching out every single night you're opening something special. It's like you just want something that comforts you, that you love. You love the flavor of, you respect the people making the beer, you respect the company behind it. They're, you know, it's the means justify the end for me. And that's what I think. Uh, that's what we do as society. We're just trying to make beer. That's it. You're getting me very emotional, Dougie. I think that's a good answer to what is next. Somebody yell out their Desert Island beer. Do you already know your Desert Island beer? Blind Pig. Blind Pig. That's a good one. Pale 31. That's my Desert Island beer. I swear to God, Pale 31. That's my beer. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, Matt, what do you think? What's next in, in, in beer? Um, yeah, I just have to echo what we were just saying. Okay. Um, um, if, you, if you look at what's happening now, it's, it's low alcohol, more balanced beers, uh, like Pilsners or Pale Ales uh, or, you know, Session IPAs, whatever you want to call them. Um, so, yeah, who knows? I mean, there's so many breweries now doing all sorts of crazy stuff. I, I've been on the road the last six weeks, maybe, and it's just seeing what a lot of a lot of breweries that have opened in the last two years, seeing what they're doing is just insane. It's awesome. It's exciting, and uh, it's like there's no rules. Anything goes. Uh, so, and local, you know, things being local. There's so many breweries now. You gotta, you know. Um, Support your local brewery. Well, that's a that's an old tagline, but support your local brewery. No, but it's a good tagline. I mean, it's still the freshest beer, and there's what there's like four, forty three hundred something breweries in the U.S. right now. Still, not everybody has a local brewery, so there's there's room to grow, right? Yeah, totally. But, most of us have a local brewery, and it should be the best beer that you can find because it's fresh and made there. And like Dougie was saying, you, maybe you know the people that make it, and you care about that. So it's, I don't care if it's old. It's a good tagline. Support local beer. Question, Wayne. Hey, guys. Um, welcome, by the way. Awesome to, yeah, uh, to have you guys join the, the festival, great festival. Um, but two questions, both for Adam. 
Um, first question is, you guys make um, clean beers and you make Brett beers. So how do you handle Brett throughout the process in order to preserve um, your clean beers? Uh, second question, what was the inspiration for Tropicalia? Sure. Uh, thanks, Wayne. Um, we um, we kind of subscribe to the fact that good cleaning procedure will take care of that issue. Um, if you have really buttoned up SOPs, which should be like the main priority, I mean, so um, Brewers Association made the quality pyramid, which I think is really cool. You know, it's like good manufacturing practices, uh, HACCP, and then you have uh, standards. So you're making your SOPs. And if you have solid SOPs and you have assurance that your people are following the SOPs, then every microorganism dies. Um, that's something Peter Booker told me. Um, they have uh, what's called like a Z factor. So Brett's got a Z factor. I don't know what it is, 4.5 or something like that. But it's a combination of pressure, temperature, chemical concentration that will kill that organism. So if you can assure that that has happened, then you can be confident moving forward. Uh, we don't do much to separate much of anything. Um, I don't put mixed fermentation through my canning line because I don't have the ability to clean it and in a manner that would uh, sort of eliminate these organisms. I don't put through my keg line for the same reason. Uh, we have some dedicated packaging, but we don't even separate hoses. Uh, we are we're possibly about to move into using the same tanks, although we have separated the cellar out uh, traditionally. Um, it's something, uh, you know, we don't do a ton of micro. We just started doing NBB and um, we haven't seen anything. And we're, uh, you know, we're pretty happy about that, obviously. Um, and, it, you know, it's certainly, I guess, a little different than a lot of people. Like I was at um, Jolly Pumpkin and they have a freaking UV tunnel that you go through and you have to like scrub down and everything to go to the other side of the brewery, which is awesome. And that's part of their procedure. Obviously, it's working for them. Uh, we've come up with our own way and, you know, happy to go into more detail, of course. Uh, that's sort of the gist of it. Um, as far as Tropicalia, um, you know, it was a collective effort. David, Blake, and myself uh, brewed pilot batches for about two years leading up to opening the brewery. We wanted to have really well-formed brands um, when we hit the ground, and we were really happy and proud that we were able to, you know, have something that was as well-received. Um, basically, I uh, sort of got the idea to do some trickery with the water chemistry to, like, really limit the bitterness. Um, sort of all about like these guys are talking about drinkability and a beer that you just want to have all day every day um, bitterness in my mind can be a barrier to that so we really really restrain the bitterness on that beer for being at what we calculate like 65 IBUs or something like that um, so we're really focusing on the fruity uh, tropical you know citric sort of uh, character in those hops um, we have a nice blend that we really like uh, Citra Centennial and Galaxy in that order um, the Galaxy is just this kind of off the wall, like just beautiful, amazing hop that's really hard to freaking secure. But um, we we think like just in a small portion, it gives that beer sort of the X factor of just deliciousness. Um, we kept the malt bill pretty restrained. Um, so we've got a, a touch of Munich, a good uh, dollop of wheat, and a little bit of crystal that we keep sort of dialing back and back and back. Um, so um, sort of where we're at, 6.5%, you know, it's like, it's not too strong. We have a few of them. All right, hopefully soon. Yeah, <laughs> got to build the brewery. But <laughs> All right, man. we're just about out of time. I just wanted to throw one more question out there. Um, if there's any aspiring brewers out there, do, you know, do you have any short advice, you know, something you've learned as a newer brewery to somebody who wants to open up and get into this business? <laughs> wear nutters. Don't wear we just, nutters. Don't wear, yeah. <laughs> Dougie learned that the hard way. No, I think it's uh, what I said before. Go work at a brewery and make sure there's uh, absolutely nothing, nothing else in the world you want to do than work at a brewery and work for a brewery because it's not easy and it seems, you know, glamorous from the outside and we're all sitting over the kettle and throwing ingredients in, but that's not the reality of it. It's a grind and you have to... I'm trying not to cuss. You have to fucking love it. You there have you to absolutely right. fucking love it. I will, and, I will allow uh, it. it. It's, it's got to be your everything. That's that's all I got. Yeah, that's it. All right. Anybody else? It's pretty good advice. Uh, advice for somebody getting in? Hey, yeah. Go yeah. No, you go ahead. Okay. I got to think about this. Um, yeah, it's tough. I mean, you're going to work your ass off. Like, you're... 
I put in, I mean, I've been at the brewery for 20 hours, 24 hours straight before, you know, like it's not like the first brew day, nothing worked and everything has to work because you have to get to the point where you have wort in the tank. So the mill didn't work for four hours and then the pumps wouldn't turn on or they're turning backwards. And, you know, it's like you're, you're going to be challenged in ways that you could have never imagined. And you just have to keep a positive outlook. Like you're in it. There's no way you can turn back around. I mean, honestly, like securing funding, uh, that's something I'd never done before, so probably a special challenge for me, but like having an appointment with a banker uh, it can be a little intimidating when it's like kind of your life on the line, you know? But you're gonna, if you're starting a small business, you're gonna know how to do everything in the business if you're one of just a couple founders, so it's really hard. <laughs> Shit, that's what I've been doing wrong. Yeah. I don't know how to do everything in my business. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anything else? Yeah, go back. Uh, yeah good. All right, let's wrap it up. No, anyway. no, no. One, One more, more thing. All right. Remember the people that came before you. Ah, there you go. That's a, a huge thing. Respect them. Look up to them. They've been doing this a lot longer than we have, a lot longer than anybody else has. Uh, I think places like Sierra, Firestone, yeah. uh, Russian River, companies like that, that is a uh, don't just think you can be them. I don't think it's going to happen. But uh, look to them as older brothers. Uh, be part of the community. Okay. Uh, contribute. Don't take away from it. Great advice. All right. That's Doug from Society, uh, Matt from Half Acre, and Adam from Creature Comfort. Thanks for hanging out with us up here. Thanks for hanging out with us down there. Uh, in just a few minutes, I think at about 2 o'clock, we're going to do another panel. It's going to be pretty interesting. It's actually breweries that have either merged with other breweries or been acquired. I know you all see that in the news right now. Um, so we're going to get up here and we're going to talk to the brewmasters about what that means uh, in the brew house, like what kind of beer we can expect now that they have more resources, maybe if things have changed. If anybody got fired, I think I'm allowed to ask weird questions. So uh, hang out. We'll do that at 2 o'clock. Thanks for sticking with us. Thank you all. The Brewing Network. Uh.